And I'm going to share the screen. Okay, uh, just check the quality of the, the sound as well as the slide. Uh, for Zoom student, can you, can you see my slide? Can you hear me? I hear nothing, so uh, wait a minute. Yes, I should. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah, can you, can you see my slide? Uh, we can see your slide. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you very much for getting back. For some reason, uh, on my screen, I cannot even see the uh, see the chat message from Zoom. So uh, I guess, yeah, that's the way sharing works. Okay. Oh, interesting. Now over here, I can see that, but not... No, I cannot move it, I'm sure. All right. We'll figure that out next time. Yeah, how do I actually, let me see. I want to move that one down a little bit. Yeah, I don't want to block here. Let me just try to move it down. And then I can do this. You go back. <laughs> anyway, okay. So I, I'm trying to cover um, a lot of topic today. Um, um, we're, we're kind of finishing uh, network file system, NFS. Um, today I'm going to extend it to AFS, which is one of them is stateless, which is NFS. Um, and AFS, Andrew file system is uh, stateful. So we're going to compare this two. And then we're going to talk about a protocol called two-phase commit protocol and try to understand um, its, uh, what it is and also its limitation. Um, by the way, two-phase commit is a really, really basic uh, protocol. It's very useful in a lot of places. You will see that um, in all kinds of distributed system, in all kinds of distributed computing, including um, GFS, Google File System which is we're gonna talk, hopefully be able to finish that by today, at least we should get started. And the other thing about two-phase commit is two-phase commit has its limitation. In fact, for, for us to study two-phase commit is not only know what it is, to understand the concept of two-phase commit is not that hard, but to understand its limitation to perform a rigorous analysis on two-phase commit and what it cannot do under what cases is something which I hope you to learn. And that's why we will very briefly talk about three-phase commit, which is two-phase commit is a simpler, popular, easy to understand, but it has a uh, weak spot that we need to address. If that weak spot won't bother us, then two-phase commit by default is, should be, uh, apply to whatever problem we try to solve. If that weak spot is something which we don't feel comfortable, then we actually should use three-phase commit. By adding another phase, we can actually address that problem, which interestingly for the model commit protocol try to uh, deal with in that particular context, three-phase commit basically is perfect. It actually can, it, it wastes, it's wastes one round of message but it's actually solve all the problem. And then we're going to talk about uh, Google File System, which um, is, is uh, of course, the industry distributed file system today, uh, more or less are based on the design of GFS. But when you look at GFS, you actually realize is not too much different from the I know snapshot that we're talking about. It's actually all kind of the whole thing is from a single file system. We just try to, 
mean, this is this is what uh, computer engineering or computer technology evolved. It's it's is whenever we have a need, we have a need for network performance. We have a need for reliability. We have a need for new kind of situation application changes. Scalability is a word that we use a lot, and it basically evolved from the concept, address the problem, move to the next level. And hopefully today's lecture can give you idea about each of this development and why they're doing that. Okay, so let's actually show this figure. The, the, this figure, the, the, the figure in the, uh, on the button is what we call stateless. And this is essentially what we, what we did with uh, network file system. Um, NFS um, essentially stateless means that the server doesn't even know the client exists. So when you open the file, the, the server does not even know that you actually opened the file. So essentially we rely on the client to maintain all the state information. For example, when you read a file, you open the file, you're reading a particular portion of a file, then server knows nothing about that. Server only respond to whatever you request individually. So in this case, you can see that pretty much everything is local, except when you want to read and write to a particular position of a, of a file, then at that time it will go to the server. So that, that's, that's essentially, uh, a stateless design. Stateless design, if you think about that, when, when you first, you didn't have any experience about distributed file system, it's probably the simplest because you essentially reduce the design of the server, essentially nothing but having this remote procedure call for you to handle uh, a handful of, of, of a call that you need to worry about. So that, that's, that's the first design of a, a stateless uh, file system NFS. And very quickly people realize that the limitation, as I said, the limitation of a technology introduce the, the motivation for the next technology. Um, so NFS technology has very quickly go into the issue of a scalability. Um, if you think about that, um, Yes, you try to do all the open, whatever close locally, you actually only do the read to the remote. So think about your application. If you're reading 32 byte of information from your file, that means if you have a file, thinking about your reading, just think about your reading a, a, um, a DVD movie. And assuming each time you read, you read, uh, say, I mean, just pick 32 baht. And so each of the call 32 baht in this picture is going to translate to that recall to the server. So essentially, when you read, a, when you watch a movie of four gigabyte, I probably exaggerate this a little bit. 32 byte is probably too small, but let's use that as an example. You're going to issue a lot of call to the server just by one single client. And the thing is that if you have today, imagine this is a Netflix and you have millions of online user want to access the server, then essentially you're, you're very quickly clocking either the network bandwidth to the server or the server capacity itself. Either one of this is probably both. In fact, um, today's technology uh, most likely you might not clogging the network bandwidth. To make a network bandwidth higher with today's uh, cloud infrastructure is actually getting better and better. But nevertheless, the server capacity is still the same. That's why they have a content distribution network. They have all kinds of technology try to address that. That's another wave of technology that's actually motivate. But initially, I remember when I was, uh, um, Okay, this is, this is a little bit confidential, but I guess it's okay. So we're, we're doing demo for, uh, in the, I remember at that time, AT&T and IBM will come to my graduate school to actually see our demo. 
And one of the worst things we don't like during the demo is there was a message say an NFS server uh, not responding because it's just too many. I mean, think about everybody wants to turn in their homework, you have that issue. So I remember one of my colleagues, his program is not that uh, uh, reliable. So what he did is that he actually has a way to catch if the program is going to call down. He knows he, his program will call down at some point, but he doesn't uh, know exactly. He doesn't have a time to fix it. So he actually catch, I think the way he do, he catch the signal. Magically, he catches the signal and then just display a message saying NFS server not responding and then blaming the NFS saying that, okay, sorry, I cannot do that demo anymore. Okay, so, so that, that's just a joke. Well, it's a real, real joke. That's actually saying that NFS server is actually um, sometimes um, um, really slow, sometimes just, just unbelievable. And, and that's why it turned out to use a stateful. By the way, stateful, one core part of design of a stable is to me, in, in, in my mind, is less about the server knows about the client. It's more about when you actually open the file, you actually cache the whole copy. So essentially when I want to look at, so at that time, I remember, I think right now, the because the file could be really huge, they cannot do that anymore. But at the time when first AFS introduced, essentially the policy is that when they will open the file, you cache the whole file to your local machine. So essentially you only, you only do it once. At the time you open the file, you get it to your local machine. And then subsequent operation is all between you and your local machine. You're not gonna bother the internet. You're not gonna bother the server. So that's why the interaction between the client and server is greatly reduced for the top picture. So essentially you think about that. If I'm actually going to cache the whole file in my first operation, and, and at that, that time the file is not that big, um, it's really fast. And after that, the only interaction you will have with a server is when you need to close the file, when you want to check the file back to the, to the server. Of course, there is an issue called consistency issue because you have multiple people want to actually cache the file. If you don't lock the file, you want to have a multiple file to actually cache, then that might be an issue for you to deal with. But, but nevertheless, that's the, highest priority for the design of Andrew file system or the first generation was stateful uh, distributed file system to, to make sure that everything is actually uh, going that way such that you reduce the load from the server. Okay, so then the only thing I need to deal with, what was that? It might be my slide generate a sound, I don't know. That's, that's, that's PowerPoint, that's PowerPoint. Okay, that's not me. All right, all right, I'll be careful. That's, that's very strange. I mean, how can they generate such kind of thing? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the key part about AFS. I sent out a, a paper, which I think that paper is really great, explain all the detail. So in, AFS one, they haven't introduced this concept called callback. The callback was introduced in AFS version two. Um, so think about this, AFS maintained the consistency, what they call um, um, weak consistency. So I want to make sure my file system is available. I want to make sure the file system can be accessed by as many people as possible and without using lock. I mean, you can still do lock. By the way, the other feature about AFS is you can use uh, um, a much better authentication. So we're using Kerberos. So Kerberos was first, in my impression, used in any kind of wide 
uh, um, spread is actually AFS. They use Kerberos. I think that was the first Kerberos system I used. So they have authentication. You can provide lock if you want, but for some of the file, it's shareable. And so when you have a file shared by multiple people, you can only have a two choice. One is what called serialization. Serialization means that I lock it and you have to wait until I unlock. And then you can actually go in there to actually um, to get the second one. So AFS using this callback, instead of make the file unavailable, what it does is basically say they will guarantee only they will inform you if the file you actually try to access has been modified by others. So see the difference. One is I do not allow anybody else to modify the file. And AFS is saying that, okay, by the callback mechanism, if you actually check out the file when you open, and then you try to write it back when you finish your editing, in between this time point, if anybody else is actually modified the master copy, then essentially you will be informed saying that, okay, this has been changed. And therefore a typical resolution is you actually need to check out the new file again. And it's client's responsibility to actually compare the first version you check out and now the new update version and then see what's the difference. And then you decide to create a copy and check back. So essentially the resolution is pushed to the application, not the file system. The file system only provide you a notification service. So that's what that callback is doing. Um, how many of you heard about um, a, a term called op optimistics uh, concurrency control? Okay, there is a protocol called optimistic. So for example, locking, you probably heard about locking. I mean, I just basically that's locking is called mutual exclusion that I do not want anybody to go in. That's called pessimistics. Pessimistics means that I do not want anybody to go in that mutually exclude the zone. Only I can go in. So if you think about operating system at the undergraduate level, mutual exclusion is so powerful to actually guarantee the safety about correctness of your program. So there is a huge other part of the system deal with synchronization is called optimistics. Optimistic is, a, is basically saying that I'm assume the probability that this kind of conflict, this kind of uh, 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 race condition will happen really rarely, really rarely. It, it will never happen. I shouldn't say it will never happen. It's happening a really low probability. And therefore, what you will do is you will allow everybody to do whatever they want without mutual exclusion. So essentially, optimistic control, I don't use mutual exclusion in any extended long period of time. I may use a little bit, very briefly, to make sure the resource is available most of the time. And, but optimistic protocol always has a validation phase. The validation phase is essentially try to see, well, I'm actually doing all this work optimistically. Now I have to check reality, whether there's somebody else is doing some work that conflict with what I'm doing. So that's called optimistic uh, um, approach. And sometimes the, the first one is called optimistic uh, concurrency control. Uh, that was uh, um, also done out of the Carnegie Mellon. By the way, AFS is actually uh, developed by Carnegie Mellon University. A lot of great idea coming out of CMU. Um, and, and therefore, Andrew file system, the way they're doing the callback is actually optimistic approach to, to handle that. Okay, so when you open the file, you see that yellow? This is called callback. So when you check out the file, you actually put the yellow dots there to saying that, hey, I'm the one who actually check out this file. So you have a yellow dot there. And when you check out, not check out, check in, you actually put the file 
back to the server. At this moment, you will check whether that yellow dot is gone. If the yellow dot is still there, that means nobody actually um, um, do anything to that file. So you, you have no conflict. You can actually just safely move the bio back. But if the yellow dot is gone, that means you already lost your callback. Means that somebody else is doing something. So at this time, what you should be doing is you should check out again. You check out the file again. At that time, you actually introduce a new yellow dot. You introduce a new yellow dot means that you actually overwritten whatever, whoever put that yellow dot there because you know that's yours. And after you're done, you check out the yellow dot, this is a new copy, and then you quickly see if you can, you need to do any kind of resolution. If you want to do that, this is totally application discretion. And then you actually check in, you check in the file. When you actually check in the file, the, the file is done, then you remove the yellow dot. So the file doesn't have any yellow dots again. Okay, so, so the three process is that when you open the file, you leave a yellow dot. When you check in the file, you save the file. If there is uh, your yellow dot still there, you finish checking, you remove the yellow. But your yellow dot is gone, then you need to create another yellow dot. And then you actually check in again. After that, you remove that. Okay, so that is, that is the idea of um, AFS. So let's actually look at some of the issue. I'm actually start, you see that I'm always look at the issue of fault tolerance. Yes, please. Yes, some kind of identity that you know that's actually from you. You, you can, the other way you can think about yellow dot, you, yellow dot might not, for security reason, you might not want um, other people to know who exactly you are, but you generate a uh, 1000 bit of random string that only you know. That, that, that means only you know that must be from you. Yes, please. So in this scenario, the client is actually doing the work twice. So yes. you have checked in first, uh, like whatever information is there that is lost. Like, like for example, in the first commit, whenever uh, the file is read, and uh, I made some changes to that file. And whenever I'm trying to write back, that file in the server is modified. Right. So we are bringing the new file into the system. Right. So that means the client has to do twice the work. Is that, is that the right? Uh, not necessarily. The, the way we usually work on it is you actually keep two different versions. Okay. So one version is, okay, you have your, in fact, you might have three versions. The first version is the version you actually check, check out. When you check out, that's the, say yesterday. And you make certain changes today. But tomorrow when you check in, there's a new version, right? So there are three copy. So when you actually check out again, you actually in your local computer, you should have three copy. And then what normally, for example, if you want to do a, if this is a program, you and I are both writing program. Okay, so I will actually see first, what is the difference between the copy I check out yesterday and the copy I got it for tomorrow. I look and see what you have changed. You're my colleague, I want to see what you have changed. And I want to see if that changes over, override whatever I changed today. If, if that's not the case, I can merge. I can merge both your input and my input and then do something. But for the, that's why it's application dependent. It's application dependent. If, if, if it's a Microsoft Word document, I don't have to do anything. But if it's, uh, if it's a program, a C++ program, I better recompile everything, do all the testing to see if the, the new program. So it's, it's, it's actually smart or lazy. They actually push all the work to the application. They only give you this notification and then the, the application need to depending on the semantics to do what's what's the best, what's the safe. Yes, please. Is there a possibility that the client might want to require to continue checking if the file on the server feature is changed? Yes, it, 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 it's it's possible. However, we want to say that um, um, the reason for AFS to be developed, there are 
at least two reasons. Number one is scalability. The performance is actually getting, getting pretty bad. Um, but the other thing is AFS also noticed is we rarely share file in a write write mode. That, that's pretty rare. Most we, we refile, right? Refile, that's okay. This is, has nothing to do with that. And it's really, we actually have you and I both write to the file. In that case, if it's a rare, then, then that's actually, this is probably a better approach to do that. Yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, this, this concept got influenced a lot of design based on this, yeah. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how Google Docs uh, implement that. Um, I'm, I actually never use Google Docs to have multiple, no, no, I use Google Doc, but I never use Google Doc in a way that you and I both modify the slide. It's usually, I watch my uh, primary using Google Doc and then he move along, I will be able to see on my screen. Uh, he can modify, I see him, her type, all the comment, all the changes, but I never change at the same time while she's doing that. I guess that's possible. That's definitely possible. So my guess is that they have to synchronize this very quickly. Then. They have to synchronize this. And the second thing is that the Google Doc, the, the primary owner of that copy has to allow me to actually access that. Okay, now, now I want to actually take it back uh, on that. Um, okay. I'm really guessing because I never use, uh, I never see the code of Google Doc. I'm thinking what Google Doc is doing is they resolve a lot of issue in the application layer, but in the file system layer, they probably just do a pen. If I'm only do a pen, means that you actually add a new uh, addition, you actually log. It's like a journaling, you add to that. And, and the thing is that in that case, if I also append when I want to add it, then essentially, eventually you will see that. And then this will be uh, supported by Google file system with Google file system support the append very nicely and consistently, and we'll be able to see all these changes. Yeah. Okay, good question. Yeah, any other question? <clears throat> okay. So there is a, a few things we need to worry about, just, just pretty much all the distributed file system. There, there are cases which the, the server crash or the client crash. So if the, if the client crash, um, essentially because we put all the stuff in the client, unless the client has some um, um, stable persistent storage, then essentially all the work is gone if it's if the client side. And in that case, the, um, the client, when they boot up, if they don't have it, they actually can do one thing. They can actually go to check whether then they sell, still have a callback on the server, if client crash and then uh, reboot. So if there is a, a callback over there, they know they have done something so they, they have to either try to recover whatever they've done on their local machine before they can actually check back in, or they have to just break their own callback and then retrieve a new copy because they lost everything. They have to restart over again. Okay, so now we're looking at the server crash. Server crash is not that bad as well because client has all the uh, local copy and I have my modification everything. So when the server crash, it really means that your callback is gone. Your callback is gone. And, and when the callback is gone, what you need to do is you just need to make a, just like 
your callback is gone normally because somebody make a modification. So what you need to do is you need to actually check out the file again to create a callback and then really compare the version number one and the version you just got and see if they make any difference. If they don't have any difference, you know, this is just a server crash. They lost the callback. You just check the file back. Okay, so regardless client crash or server crash, AFS can handle that pretty well, okay? Okay, that's actually probably a really, really short introduction to the AFS. And now I'm actually going to talk about the atomic commit protocol, which is now we're actually going to extend from one client, one server to probably one client, multiple server. Because it's an extension, you realize that, oh, wait a minute, uh, I have uh, uh, one server and the server will crash. What happened if I have multiple server? So I have a multiple server for two cases. Those server are heterogeneous server, means that they're doing different things for me. But I'm a one client, and now because uh, I want to split the work to have multiple parts, they're doing different work, but still I'm the coordinator. Or I can do one client with homogeneous server, means that they're doing exactly the same thing. I want to make sure I have some replication reliability. If one fail, I can still get what I want. In either case, we're talking about one client and now I change the word, I change the word from client to coordinator. So I have a one coordinator that among a bunch of server. So in order for me to be able to operate, manage the server, um, to make sure that we're all doing things consistently. For example, uh, I want to make sure that if this three server are actually doing different things, but they need to be all on the same page. Then I want to make sure all three of them are actually okay before I uh, do that. Think about this as a, one of the server is booking your flight ticket to uh, uh, a business meeting. And the other um, server is actually booking for your hotel. And the other server is booking for your uh, COVID test. So you want to make sure that all three of them are actually ready to go for you to do that. You don't want to book the ticket, book the hotel, then you realize your COVID test uh, is positive, right? So, so essentially you want to make sure that all of them will happen at the same time so you can actually do this. This is called uh, commit protocol. All right, so we're having a commit aboard. So um, essentially there is, of course, there is a, what we call one phase commit protocol. Um, one phase commit protocol is essentially the client just basically asks the server to go ahead, commit or aboard. So, so basically client is making all the decision. And, and this actually has a one big problem is that if the server detects something different, they cannot voice their opinion. So one phase commit protocol only work for some simplified cases, which the server never need to say no. So it's not very useful to be honest with you. So we're actually looking at two phase commit. So what is two phase commit? Two phase commit is essentially, all right. Can I kill the sound? Okay, I'll figure out next time. So what? Okay, let me let me see if that's this will work. Okay. Here I is, wait a minute. How do I do this? I, I'm just make sure I won't. I cannot touch it. Oh, okay. Let's let's see how it works. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I have to do this again. Okay, now it's no uh, no sound. Okay. I hope remote student can still hear me. Uh, yeah, we can still hear you. <laughs> and I, I can still hear the, the ring. Okay. 
<laughs> there is a new technology, okay, need to develop to resolve this problem. I mean, uh, apparently Microsoft need to make sure their product or PowerPoint will interpret uh, the natural language processing so they know I, I hate that sound at this moment. Okay, anyway. Um, so there are two phases. The phase one is essentially doing what we call voting. So you ask them, you know, what's your result? Do I have a hotel reservation? Okay. Do I have a plane ticket? I can afford the price? Yes. And do I have uh, uh, a COVID uh, test within 48 hours to be uh, negative? So you essentially ask for the votes. And the phase two is basically if all of them says, okay, to go, then essentially the phase two is from the client is telling everybody, hey, please go ahead to do whatever uh, we want to do, such as in this case, it's probably just airplane ticket and a hotel, okay? So the protocol works this way. The protocol works this way. And so you have this two phase. The first phase is coordinator to the server, coordinate to the server. And of course, you have to worry about the, the the failure. There are all kinds of failures. Um, for example, you can have um, a server fail at any time, the client can fail at any time. And, and in fact, I want to actually show this figure. I want to show this figure. This figure shows the protocol states of a two phase commit protocol. Um, the left side is the server. The right side is a coordinator. So let me actually first explain uh, what the state diagram is showing. And then we see that when it can, it can go wrong. Um, so the first coordinator um, at some point is going to do a process called can commit. So that can commit will be issued by the client is asking them to commit or not. So essentially ask them to vote. So what we are actually asked them to do is the, the, uh, the coordinator is gonna send the message, the first phase to all the, um, all the servers and essentially the server will vote. After they vote, they actually stuck in a very important state called wait state. Okay, by the way, you see that there is a direct link over here to say abort. So essentially, if the, if the server actually decide he want to abort, he can actually just go abort because the semantic of two-phase commit, of course, this, you can modify if you want, but the semantic of two-phase commit is saying that we will commit only if everybody, every server says commit. If any one of us says abort, then essentially we'll go to abort state. So therefore, if you actually already realize before you do the voting, before you wait for the result, if it's abort, you can actually directly go to the abort state. That's the server is, is going to do. Okay, so essentially you're actually collecting the, um, you're collecting all the vote from the client. And after you collecting the, the client, then you actually decide whether you want to go for do a board or do commit. As I said, you will do commit only if all the votes, you actually, number one, you've got all the votes. The second, all the votes says commit. Then you're actually sending that message over here to the server, to every one of them. And then they can move to either the commit or a board. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually similar to you miss some vote, right? It will tie up. So the, 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 um, the coordinator can set up a tie up. And for example, that tie out, you can decide maybe 15 seconds. If within 15 seconds, I didn't get all the, uh, all the votes, I'm assume this is a board. This means that I might the next round, I might use a different server because the 
Well, it's only one server, right? If you have a three, three uh, servers in this case, um, only one of them are res not responding. So, uh, when we are connecting the words, one server won't respond any of the time. So, until and unless we don't get all the words, words that all the servers need to respond with a abort or a commit message. But if like, one server is down all the time, then technically. No, if the one server is down, what I'm saying is you should change your server. So in fact, this is a typical situation is that, let me use an example. If I book my flight with United Airlines and hotel and COVID is always okay, but United Airlines is not responding. So I might just change to American Airlines. So I'm still using American Airlines and then, uh, or, or I'm actually changing two different travel agents. They, they can book any fly I want. So I just, you're as a coordinator, you have a choice. In fact, we will see that in the Google file system when they actually do this kind of stuff, they realize that for either, it's, in fact, there's multiple case, the server is down or the network is unreliable to the server. If you think about that, some of the cable got cut off that server. And the third thing is that the network is unreliable such that the message got lost. The server never got that vote met, the, the uh, can commit message and therefore it may never respond. So you have a choice as a client, whether you want to actually try again, but there is a tying out mechanism that you need to, you need to, uh, you need to uh, give up on that, that particular server. You're talking about the heterogeneous Server. Not a homogeneous server. I would assume that all the servers are on the same task. And even in that case, all the servers have to respond to get to a stage which would... Oh, I see. I, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, if we talk about homogeneous server, um, it depends on application. Some application may be okay to have a two. That's enough. But um, for example, Google file system, they have a three copy. So it means that every single uh, file chunk, they have to have three copy for reliability reason. So even though they are homogeneous, I still need to uh, find another server. I might be able to reuse those two server already respond. I might be able to optimize that, but I need to find another server. It really depending on how the application semantic to decide what's in the cargo. Yeah, okay. All right, so here are some um, possible uh, cases that's actually um, could, could fail. In fact, it could fail any time. For example, one of the time is some of the server, they actually missed the message. I mean, just, they, they didn't get it. Network is unreliable. Um, they never get the can commit message or the, the, some of the votes sending back, either because the server never sent back the votes or the network actually dropped those packets so the votes didn't come back. Um, but in any case, coordinator missed some of the response from the server in the voting, right? And, and then the second phase, when you actually want to tell the server to do either commit or board, those messages might get lost. So some of the message, they never actually got it to them. Or it could be the server, I mean, this is actually extreme. You think about the client, a coordinator. I'm the coordinator, I got all the votes. And I'm gonna send out say three message to this three server. I already make my mind about do a four or do commit. But the thing is that I actually send out the first message to the server, then I crash. So only one of the three server or two of the three server actually got that do commit or do a four message. And then the, the, the coordinator crashed. And how do we actually handle each of the case? And that's why two-phase commit, the protocol itself is simple, but consider all possibility of failure is actually not that easy to, uh, to understand. So I'm actually going to use this case 
it's probably easier for you to think about this case. Okay, so assuming, let's assuming that uh, this is the one of the, the four cases I was talking about, one of three or four cases, depending on how you, how you classify that. Uh, I better stand here. I keep moving this way and then I realize the sound is going to be bad. Um, by the way, just checking, uh, Zoom student, is the sound better today? Uh, yes. Okay, all right. You know, I, I, I disciplined myself, didn't, didn't walk. Next time I will do a paint to paint a circle saying that I can only stay in that circle or something like that. I need to do that. Okay, you know what? Give me a second. Do I have a piece of paper? Yeah. This is called uh, 21st century. Okay, I set the boundary, okay? Never cross you. All right, stay here. All right, good. All right, so um, we assume that the coordinator crash after the can commit message, after. Okay, I, I already say, uh, I, I basically, what happened is I, I send a message, say, hey, please vote. So can commit message is actually over there. It basically asks people to vote. But at some point after I send out that message, um, I crash. Okay, so then there are four cases. There are four cases. In, I'm assuming that the coordinator already sent out the can commit message. Maybe not all of them, but some of them at least go out. And the thing is that now I have a few cases over here, zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, four cases. Um, the, the case number one is that some of the server that's actually uh, have not received the, the vote request means that um, only one or two got it, but the other one didn't get it because it crashed after I sent out the first one or two can't commit mess. That's case number one. Um, the, the, the second case is all the good server are in the waste state. All the good server are in the waste state. So what do I mean by good server? So I'm actually assuming there are two kinds of server. One kind of server is a good server. It means that after the, after the coordinator crash, they still alive. But the problem is that what happens if I have say three server, but two of them are good, but one of them also crash when the coordinator crash. So basically I'm saying one coordinator crash, I only have one coordinator, the coordinator crash, one of the server crash, and two of the server are in good state. Okay, so that's case number two. Case number three, that I actually realized some of the server already actually moved to a board or commit state. Some of the server already moved to that state. Okay, we'll see what happened is that, for example, this is a case, right? You have somebody in it, you directly go to a board state or because the protocol you moved so much, I said it crashed after can commit, but I didn't say how much they actually move along with this process. Okay, I didn't, I only say it crashed after this one, but I didn't say how far it can potentially go. So there are some server already in board or commit state. And then the number three, of course, is all the server are either in commit or board state. Okay, so that number four, let's actually handle number four. Number four cases is much easier. So, so let me actually tell you what, what my scenario is. So this is the coordinator, sorry, the coordinator dot. And now what you can do is you can do what we call leader re-election. You actually use a, you do this machine die, you actually use the other machine to be like a coordinator. So you can think about this as a little bit mix of stateful and stateless in this case, but now it's a client in the server. So you have a different client come out, but this client is different from the original one because all the data is lost. So all you have is uh, whatever you have on those three servers that you're interact with. So if the case is number three, it's probably very easy. If all of server 
saying they are a board or commit. And by the way, you cannot have, uh, um, by the way, okay, let me, let me say that. If all three of them says commit, then essentially it's a commit, right? All the server says commit is a commit. If one or two of them says abort, because remember it's possible you have a mix of abort and commit because some of the, some of the server can directly actually move over here for abort. So if you have, uh, I take a back. In the strict implementation of two-phase commit, you cannot have both abort and commit. Because if one says commit, it must be they receive the voting result to actually move from the way to the commit. If that's happened, it means all the vote must be positive. And therefore it's impossible for you have a mixture of commit or vote. It could be all commit or all vote, doesn't matter. Okay, so case number four is easy because I know it's, it's either all commit or a board, then I'm a new coordinator. I just boot up. So, okay, I'm going to choose whatever the server says. Okay, this is assuming all three servers or all K servers are all up. Okay, and the similar case for number two. Similar case for number two is that the case number two is basically say, hey, I have, say I have a, you know, uh, three server and two of them are saying commit. But the other one, I don't know. The other one is probably in the way state, okay? So you can think about case number two. I'm actually talking about this case. So essentially you have two of them already go to commit. And one of them, if you're not in commit, you cannot be in a board if the other two are commit. So if you're in commit, you must be in a wait state, right? You must be in a wait state. So it means that the server, I'm sorry, the, the coordinator already sent out the do commit message, but sent two of them successfully, but the third one was actually killed. Um, the third one never got it. So that's why the third server is actually in the way state. So in this case, it's still good because I know you have actually collect all the positive vote. Otherwise, I cannot do the commit for the other two. So that's why in case number two, if not all of them, but just one of them or two of them says commit, then essentially the whole thing should commit. Meaning that the third one in the way state, they should actually move forward to the commit. Does that make sense? So case number two and case number three, if the coordinator crash, with a very short amount of time, you just check all the server, their, their status, then you can actually decide, okay, I actually need to do a commit or board. So there's no delay whatsoever. Okay, any question for case number two and case number three? Okay, two, okay. So let's look at case number zero, right? Because case number one is actually the troublemaker. Okay, so let's take a look at case number zero. Case number zero saying that some of them have not received the vote request, meaning that they're actually still here at the init state. They're in the init state, some of them. Some of them might have actually already receive, but which means that some of them in this state, some of them actually in waste state. If, if, if any one of them is in this state, it's impossible for anybody to come aboard or commit, right? If you're still in the init. So therefore, if all of you are actually in it or waste state, then regardless the situation, just aboard, just aboard. You essentially ask them to vote again. You can do that to shortcut a little bit, but basically you don't lose anything. You just basically restart the transaction or do something like that, okay? So that's, 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 so in case zero, two, three, there is uh, no problem at all um, for, for the server crash. Okay, I just realized I forgot to use the mic. <clears throat> that's why I feel I'm yelling today. All right, let's see if I can speak a little bit louder. 
so I can actually survive my voice for office hour today. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, so let's actually look at case number one. That's the trouble case I'm talking about which means that I have a three server, one of them is down, but two other, which are online, are in waste state. So it means that the, um, the hotel website is down. I don't know that server, but the airline is in waste state for me. And the, uh, um, the, the test result for COVID is also in waste there. Okay, in this case, I actually re-elect a new coordinator. So I have a new coordinator. So what should we do at this moment? I want to ask you in this case, case number one, what should we do? All the good server are in waste there. What should we do? Okay, the, the one of the I suggestion is let's do a board. What do you think? Do you think a board is okay? Say, say it again. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, I, let, let's say yes, you, you need to do that. You have a, there, there's a hand I, I saw. Yeah, please. Okay, okay, good. So both suggest a board, but you kind of set the timer for your server to come back. So let me actually ask you a scenario because I know those two good server that's our up, their state is a waste state. But where you think that there was a one server, the hotel server is down. What could possibly be that particular bad server's state before it crash? What could be the possible state? Why not? Okay, in fact, the answer is, that's the key point. The answer is that the other server can be in any state. Let me tell you why. So I actually, the, the, the coordinator receive all the votes, receive all the votes, assuming receive three votes. And all three of them says commit. So he started to send do commit message but he sent the do commit message to the hotel server. And then the coordinator died. The coordinator died after that, right? So the, the, um, um, the airline and the COVID test, they never get the do commit or do a board message. So therefore they're both in the way state. But the hotel server, they actually got to do commit. And then they charge a credit card to go ahead and book the hotel. And then they crash too. Remember, they become unavailable, right? So essentially we're in this corner case such that we actually don't know the state of that uh, bad server or crash server. It's not bad, it's just crash, unavailable. And therefore it could be anywhere. It could be a board. Could be commit or could be in it or could be wait. It could be in any of the four states showing the diagram. And therefore we get stuck. In fact, this is a very important lesson for you to know is that that's the weak spot for two-phase commit. That's the only case. I mean, how likely it's going to happen? Very, very unlikely, right? You have to be exactly the timing to fit into this. But when this happened, you actually have no resolution, except you have to wait. Either the original coordinator to actually come back to life if it has a uh, persistent storage, 
or you wait, you have to wait for the hotel server to come back. So essentially, in all other cases, when you crash, you have instantaneously, you can decide how to move forward. But this two, it really, you need those server. If those two server, for some reason, it took two days for them to come back, then you have to wait for two days because you don't know what's going on with the hotel. If the hotel server come back and say, hey, we already, I already received this uh, can commit message from your original server, probably stop. And hopefully the, the hotel server will come back in one minute. Otherwise, they lost their business anyway, right? So, so that, that's kind of, you, I'm using this hotel as an example, but the general commit protocol, that is actually a, a weak spot for two-phase commit protocol. Okay, so I hope you will learn because this is very important for you to know precisely under what condition you have to wait until the crash server to come back. You cannot just restart this new uh, coordinator, new server. Okay. All right, so in response to this, we actually change not the uh, server side, but the, uh, the, the, sorry, the server side, actually. I actually changed the diagram to be this diagram. This is called three-phase commit. This is called three-phase commit. Um, now I'm just adding a commit into two stage. One is called pre-commit. One is called commit. I'm actually adding this two. So I'm actually require there is another act message from the server that back to the um, back to the um, to the um, coordinator, and with introducing this new stage, now the problem I talked about in the previous one previous slide got resolved because if all the good server are in the waste state then essentially that particular server that's crash is actually in pre-commit. It cannot be commit state, right? Because if, if, if the rest are in waste state, you cannot be um, um, already commit. You have to actually go one extra round of uh, uh, synchronization protocol. And therefore, as long as you're pre-commit, you cannot charge my credit card, the hotel server. And therefore, if it's pre-commit, I'm still be able to afford the whole thing if everybody is away. And that's that's the way. It's a very simple extension. By, by the way, if you Google it, it's it, it's a it's a PhD thesis <laughs> trying to address this problem. It's pretty pretty complicated to prove the property, but the idea is very simple. And, and the motivation is exactly that weakness about two-phase commit protocol. Okay, so so just tell you that there are two versions. One is two-phase commit, one is three-phase commit. They're both simple to understand, simple to implement. The trick is the difference in terms of their power in handling all kinds of failure. And if you actually want to apply to a system which you actually worry about this kind of very small probability that's, and you want to make sure your file system is always available, ready to use, then you might want to consider the three-phase commit, okay? All right, that's the important thing. All right, I'm going to, I have a 13 minutes. Let's actually move to Google File System. I will show you why this is, uh, let me see. Yeah, this is a, just the diagram for the, um, for the um, three-phase command. I'm going to skip this uh, replicate the file system. I'm just directly go to Google File System. Okay, so what is a GFS? Let me actually explain to you what GFS is. Then we actually come back to actually see why they make this design of the Google file system. The, the picture of a Google file system looks like this. Um, here is your application. You can think about this as application that need to do all the uh, file system. And then the system call interface to the file system is somewhere between the app and the master. And master is essentially the kernel that managing the whole file system tree. So the master is actually very important because there's only one master. Of course, you can have a replicate master. 
But this master essentially provide all the information regarding what is the directory structure, where is the file. So essentially, if we learned about the idea of I know, so the I know information is actually in the master. And then you have what we call chunk server. So essentially chunk server is a storage system that's actually have a lots of hard disk. And you can see that under the chunk system, chunk server, for each of the file, I actually use a disk block, but here I call a chunk. And the first design of the Google file system, each chunk is about 64 megabyte. Okay, so it's a 64 megabyte chunks. And for example, you can see that, um, let me see, do they have the things I want? Okay, for example, file one, the chunk one is here, chunk two is here. And then the file one, I also have another uh, chunk here. And file two, I have a chunk here, I have a chunk here as well. So essentially, um, logically the file is being organized by the master, but the hardest block is actually distributed and replicate. By the way, it's distributed, and replicate, they keep three copy for reliability and performance reason um, and amount uh, lots of chunk servers. So you can think about, you might have uh, a large number, thousands of chunk server and uh, at least, and then each of them is actually handling hosting a part of your file that you're interested in. And we're trying to access to that is actually in this picture. Okay, so this is, application master chunk server and the chunks. That's, that's basically the basic uh, structure of the file system. Um, any question? Yeah. So this is a design in the early 2000 and the file is actually getting bigger and bigger. So at that time they, they chose, I, and by the way, I, I don't need to defend for Google about why they choose that one. But I, I think 64 megabyte, uh, it was a choice about 20 years ago. I think today it might be even bigger, might be even bigger. So, so I would say, um, how do I say that? It depending on what kind of file you want to store. If you want to store a file like uh, a content, media content, and each of them are probably easily uh, to the gigabyte and or big database. For example, for large file, maybe you need bigger chunks to be more efficient. But if you uh, want to um, handle small file, like email, those kind of very small, 64 megabyte might be sufficient. It's really depending on application. I would say that the, yeah, I don't, I don't know the, exactly what's the, what's the size being managed today in the Google file system, but that's initially 64 megabytes. Yeah. I remember reading it somewhere that the design team picked them up because for MD was to do with the amount of memory that the system had. Okay, okay. Oh, that might, it might make, make sense. Yeah, because they want to be able to respond that really quickly, right? They store in the memory. When you have a network, when, when you want to access a file, you actually bring it to the memory and just use that. That could be possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, might, re I might remember reading that. I forgot already. Yeah, it's, I'm getting, getting rusty about the, the things I read. Okay, that's why I mean, before every class, I have to remember this. I say, do I remember this? Anyway, all right. All right, so. Essentially, the directory structure is under master. Let me actually show you a picture about what's, what's um, tell you what is the mode of the operation before we, uh, you go. Okay, I want to use this picture to tell you the operation. I will explain this picture and then next week we'll continue to finish the, um, um, so today I want to give you a concept and next week I'm actually going to do the programming part. 
So then that's related to your next programming assignment. That's why uh, I want to make sure that you understand the whole basic concept. So um, here's a master, here's an application, which is a client. And here you have three server, we call the replica. We have a primary replica and two secondary replica A and B. And here is a master. The way it works in GFS or Hadoop, they're, they're basically following the same design principle, is that the client, of course, when you access a file, you must access to the, um, what do we call the directory structure. When you want to access directory, you go to master. And when you go to the master, at some point you realize that this is a file you actually want to access. And you have to tell the master what is the offset you try to access. Okay, for the file, which part of the file I try to access. So you provide the information to the master. What master is going to return to you is the handle in each of the chunk server that related to that particular chunk that you try to access. So essentially you're actually getting the chunk server, but that's why step one and two, if this is actually copy from the paper, I sent it to you today, is essentially step one and two is just getting the information for you to actually know what is the replica, which is the chunk server, and for you to contact them to do certain things, okay? And, and then you, what you're going to do, this part is actually quite interesting. Um, GFS was designed, try to separate the control and the data flow. So what is the data flow? Data flow is easy. If I want to update the chunk, if by the way, the read that's easy, read, I just read the chunk, that's no problem. But when you write a chunk, you're actually going to write three copies. That's the requirement. Every single one I want to have, I want to have a three copy, three server. And I want to separate the data flow and control flow. So what is the data flow? Data flow represents how do I really copy the data, the new chunk I want to put in, in my file to all three replica. That's the data. And control is essentially saying when you can actually really move the file from that copy, I just push that thick data flow to actually the right place, which is essentially a can commit message. So essentially, I'm actually pushing the data over there. If you think about two phase commit, the first phase is actually pushing the data over there. And the second phase in control is actually really for all three, after all threes are actually done, that they are actually all of them at the same time, move the file to the uh, public location to make that chunk to be publicly available for subsequent uh, operation they can access to that. So that, that's why you have all the thin arrow represent the, uh, the control flow and the thick represent the, the data flow. Okay, so there are certain details. So the, the, uh, the data flow, control flow operation, um, they, they actually also multiply by network bandwidth. So they want to actually separate this. Have you noticed that for the control flow, the client directly access to the primary and let the primary contact the other secondary replica. But for the data, they actually push directly from client to the second replica, not to the primary. The reason is I want to divert the traffic. I, I actually don't know how much bandwidth you're going to save, but the thing is that at least you actually do this in two different network paths. And, and therefore you potentially uh, save some low balance uh, by low balance. Okay. Okay, that's number one. I just want to let you know that. Number two is actually very important is there is a one very important property about GFS, means, meaning that if there are multiple updates to the same file, multiple updates to the same file, 
I want the those updates be consistently applied to this file or to this chart in the sense that you won't have uh, what we call the inconsistency update and such that you're fine. I actually use this picture, but I, I, I need to explain later. But what do I mean inconsistent? The inconsistent means that I actually, when you read from the primary and when you read from the replica, you're actually going to see different value for the chunks represent the same file. What we want to do, there are two terms. One is called define, one is called consistent. Define basically say, I'm actually going to see everything autonomy, atomically. Means that I'm actually going to see all the update that's actually going to be finished. And then I'm going to see a clean picture. That's actually uh, defined. And consistent is a weaker level of uh, consistency criteria. By the way, this two term is defined in the uh, GFS paper. Uh, I will probably um, keep talking about that because we're running out of time here. Um, let's actually stop here. Um, but uh, I, I hope you have a good weekend. I will see you next Tuesday, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs>